All right, we are ready to begin talking about New Testament exegesis, getting into uh, kind of the fun part of the class, and obviously we're going to spend more time talking about New Testament exegesis than we did Old Testament exegesis, because of a number of reasons, but foremost is the New Testament is uh, our covenant, and so we need to make sure that we understand uh, what is actually there in the text. So as we did with the Old Testament, so also with the New Testament, we're just going to walk ourselves through some fundamental steps. The very first fundamental step is you got to learn to think in terms of entire books. reminding ourselves that the books were delivered whole. And if you kind of got that with the Old Testament, you really get that with the New, because 1 Corinthians was all 16 chapters. He didn't send 1 Corinthians to the church at Corinth one chapter at a time uh, with a um, to be continued at the, the bottom of uh, chapter 1. Uh, all 16 chapters. And so uh, all 27 books in the New Testament uh, were written from that perspective with the idea of uh, their receiving this as a whole. Now, you should already have this quote, yeah, those of you that copied it off of the, uh, the thumb drive. But this is what Gordon Fee says. There is no substitute for this step. You never start exegeting a book in chapter 1, verse 1. You never would do that. The first step always is to read the entire document through. You need a provisional sense, and I like the way he frames that, a provisional sense of the whole before analyzing any of its parts. And then, uh, and you gain such a sense by reading it through. So we're trying to get a sense of the forest, and then we can analyze the trees. And sometimes we get the cart before the horse and we're trying to analyze the trees, but we never quite get around to getting the big picture of what's really going on. But when you read a book through, you get this provisional sense. You get this idea of what this is really all about. And so as we talked about with Old Testament books, you know, you've got some challenges. You've got Luke. You've got Acts. There are long books, and it's going to take you several hours to read through in one sitting Luke or read through in one sitting Acts. But do that. Find a block of time where you can sit down, and my suggestion would be that you get an audio, then you play the audio while you're following along with your own eyes in the Bible text. And so you're working on visual as well as uh, the audio processing. It's a good way of tapping in more than one of the senses. Also, we talked about if you're going on a trip, you're going to be preaching someplace maybe on a Sunday, and it's going to take you a couple hours to get there. Well, get a tape, a CD of Luke, and listen to Luke. Uh, as you're traveling down the road, and you'll uh, you'll get this provisional sense uh, of the book. So learn to think in terms of entire books. Now, when we think talk about this, there are always some preliminary questions that we're going to ask before reading the book through in one city. I'm going to say, what is the genre? Is it gospel? Is it Acts? Epistle? Apocalypse? Uh, What is it uh, when we're talking about these New Testament books? Now, that may or may not mean anything 
uh, to you, uh, especially if it's a new uh, convert. Um, genre, though, for those of us that have been studying the Bible for some time, we understand that what is happening in the Gospel of Matthew is different than what's happening in First Corinthians. Uh, it's a different type of writing, and the purpose of those writings uh, are different. And so, just like with the Old Testament, we understand the difference between law and narrative and poetry and prophecy. So also in the New Testament, we get that Revelation is just not like First Corinthians. It's just not. Uh, and so you're not going to read Revelation the way you read First Corinthians. You've got to understand the, the genre between the two. And then, the author. Who is it that's writing this book? Now, with nearly every New Testament writer, you're going to have a little bit of background that if you can do a shortcut, you can pull off a commentary and read what that commentary says about the author. And hopefully that commentary is going to give you the biblical information about Matthew. Who was this guy? All right, I'm going to read Matthew. All right, so what does the Bible tell me about Matthew? Well, tax collector. Oh, well, who's that? Well, he's a publican. Oh, that helps. Uh, well, uh, is that as opposed to a Democrat? Uh, Matthew was the conservative. All right, so you look, you, you try to figure out what that is, and right there in the text, you find out what uh, a publican or a tax collector is. He was one of the chosen. He was one of the twelve. He was an apostle. Okay, so this is written from the perspective of a guy that traveled with Jesus from place to place. All right, so you're asking questions about author. All right, so I, I'm going to study First Corinthians. What do I know about Paul, who is claiming to be the guy that wrote 1 Corinthians. Well, he was an apostle. He was the one that started the church of Corinth. Anyway, you, you kind of get what I'm saying in developing some background information about the author. And then third, you're going to ask, going to ask a question about dispensation. The Gospels were written before the church was established. So these are the preliminary days that are leading up to the establishment of the church. Then when we get to the book of Acts, we put the book of Acts in its context as uh, the beginning of the church. And then we go from uh, Romans to Revelation, understanding these are all church books. These are all books written in the context of now the church is established, now we're dealing with uh, the problems, the issues, the doctrinal questions, and so on, that these churches are all facing. <clears throat> all right, so that's dispensation, uh, and really you're only talking virtually about two uh, dispensations in the New Testament. Just like, really, you're talking about two dispensations in the Old Testament. You've got the patriarchal and you've got the mosaic um, in the Old Testament. So, anyway, uh, those are uh, questions that you need to kind of have worked out. All right, so let's say that um, you not quite got the dispensation thing worked out. That's going to be okay. Uh, you can sort of make sense of all that. Uh, the more that you go through and you study the New Testament. So, we're wanting to learn to think in terms of entire books. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of James. Now, we don't have time to analyze all five chapters of the book of James, but this is a little mini exercise that I want you uh, to do, and that is look in chapter 1 and find ideas or words that you also find repeated in chapter 5. 
So let's take two or three minutes and just kind of flip back and forth. What do you find in one that you also find in chapter five? Okay. I'm taking some time and, and look at this. Uh, Reggie, what what did you find that was uh, in chapter one and chapter five? Cow and bless. What was the first one? Count. Count. Where, where did you see count in uh, chapter five? Verse 11. Suffering, patience, faith in both one and two. Good. Yeah. Excellent. The themes, those themes repeated again. Yeah. Yeah. Riches, death, and sin. Riches, death, sin. All right. I didn't have room for all of these, but this is kind of what we're talking about. Patience talks about that in chapter one. Talks about it patience in chapter five. He talks about endurance. He talks about joy. I don't think anybody mentioned that one, but uh, maybe you had it in your list. Uh, the word complete is found in both places. Uh, the, the concept of prayer is something that is uh, predominant in both chapters. Sin, which was just mentioned. Uh, and then the rich, uh, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1, and he comes back around they're talking about the rich in chapter 5. All right, what do you get from that? Uh, now is the time to ask the, the so what question. So what? So what if we found some things in chapter 1 and found them again in chapter 5? What's the so what? It's a chiasm. <laughs> uh, that would be a E. <laughs> yeah, these are going to be important themes that we could... Potentially use as keywords in the book. Yeah. Um, keywords, themes, threads that are going to be uh, running through the book. Now, it may very well be that he's not going to say another thing about sin uh, until we get to chapter 5. Uh, but if he starts with something and ends with something... That right there is going to tell me at least that those were predominant ideas, so much so that he felt like he needed to come back around to those ideas at the very end. Now, you can do this with every New Testament book. And just look at chapter 1 and then look at chapter 28 of Matthew and say, what am I seeing that we started with and we're ending with? And you will be surprised at how many of these that you're going to come up with. Now, I, I chose one of the better ones uh, because there really is a long list, and you guys came up with another five, six, or seven that I didn't have on here. Uh, 
Um, but we're, we're all on the same track. You got uh, what it is that we're looking for. And so we make a, a mental note uh, to ourselves. When you read a book, you're thinking about a book in its entire context. You're going to pick up on these. Because how long would it take you to read the, the book of James? Maybe 30 minutes? Well, in 30 minutes' time, you're not going to have forgotten that we talked about sin in chapter 1. You're not going to have forgotten that we talked about patience uh, in chapter 1. Because that was just a few minutes ago that you were reading that. And now you get this provisional sense of a book that we're talking about. After this class, there's no more 30 minutes. It's forever. (laughs) I mean, it's never ending. Well, that's true. Where do we draw the line? You uh, you don't. (laughs) I mean, you die still not knowing uh, everything, but that's okay. When we think about the whole Bible, even the whole Bible is this way, which to me is evidence of inspiration. Have you ever thought about the parallels between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22? It is astonishing and it is amazing how the book of God even fits the very exercise that we're talking about. We began talking about the heavens and the earth. In Revelation, we talk about the new heavens and earth. In Genesis 1, we talk about lights created. In Revelation, we talk about the Lamb being the light. Man's original home is by a river. Man's eternal home by a river. Paradise is lost. Paradise is regained. Talk about the cunning and power of the devil. Well, in Revelation, the devil's thrown into the lake of fire. Genesis, man sent away from God. In Revelation, man is home forever with God. Genesis, man's barred from the tree of life. In Revelation, man's given eternal access to the tree of life. idea that we started out with some ideas and we're ending up with uh, those same ideas. And so we talk about the scheme of redemption and the story of the Bible from beginning to end. Well, God intended for all 66 books to function as a, a, a unit that is telling a story about God's people, the fall, and then the restoration of God's people that we read about in Revelation. So when we're looking at it as a whole, you know, we're not getting lost in, well, 66 books, 1,400 years, 40 different authors. uh, And so somehow or another, it it all kind of got collected (coughs) together. So this was all a part of God's carefully crafted providential work. In bringing that scheme of redemption, that story of God dealing with man, telling that story from beginning to end. Uh, And it's very cool. But this is not an accident. This is most certainly very intentional and is illustrating uh, the work of God when we're thinking about these books from beginning to end. All right. Step number two is to find key words and phrases.
Kaiser says many terms were invested with such significance, either at the time of their first occurrence or in subsequent appearances, that they came to act somewhat as trigger words, if we may use that expression, to call to the audience's mind most, if not all, of a preceding theology which informed the text in which they occurred. All right, now that, that's a, almost a mind-numbing uh, sentence. <laughs> but what Kaiser is saying is that the recurrence of these words is drawing our attention to what it is that the author is emphasizing. So these words, he says, are especially important in passages presenting the Messianic doctrine and the doctrine of salvation. In these words, which received extraordinary amount of attention, a technical status is born. We're going to put more attention, more emphasis on these words than uh, we might otherwise. This technical status. So what is it that the inspired writer is doing with this particular word uh, that we're seeing uh, predominating in the text? So our goal is we need to find these words. Now, we've already mentioned that uh, our English translations uh, sometimes do not help us in finding these key words and phrases. But you do not need to know Hebrew, and you do not need to know Greek to still find, uh, still find these words. <clears throat> it helps, but it's not uh, necessary uh, for this to happen. And I'll talk about um, how you can find key words and phrases even without knowing the, the biblical languages. All right, so we're wanting to find these key words now. How do we find key words? The answer is with the four P's. Prevalence. Purpose statement. Prayers, petition verbs. The four Ps. What are the four Ps? These are the four ways that you can find key words in a book. All right, so let's walk our, our this is all step number two. We're going to be camped on step number two here for uh, some time, probably the rest of, uh, of today. Um, so let's talk about prevalence. By way of illustration, how might I go about finding those repeated words those words that uh, are prevalent in the book of Romans. Next quarter, when you take uh, Michael Hyde's class on using the Logos Bible software, he will show you how you can use that software to generate reports like this. All right, so I'm asking it, to give me, generate a report for me of all of the occurrences of the word God in the book of Romans. Now, this is not asking how many times the, the English word God occurs in an English translation. This is asking every time the word theos, the Greek word for God, whether you knew that or not, is not relevant, but you're asking it every time that Greek word occurs in the book. So, uh, if you look at the top, you can see that uh, I've got 161 results in 139 verses 
And it took me 40 seconds to four tenths of a second uh, to generate that report. Get your coffee. Yeah. <laughs> now, back in the old Denny days, how long do you think it would have taken me to find 161 occurrences of God in Roman? You're not very long. You're so wise. <laughs> that does not I'm guessing you didn't do well in your midterm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you already tried to score points. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> well, we're we're talking even with the concordance, uh, like Young's or Strong's, uh, he's going to have it listed, but he's probably going to have it broken down. And so I've got to combine several lists, uh, and even then, uh, they're probably going to miss some. It's been my experience that uh, Strong and Young's are going to miss some. But uh, those of you that uh, um, are going to have Bible software, uh, get you a Young's, get you a Strong's, and they they can help you in in that. In uh, now, what is going to key me off that uh, this was or, or tip me off that this is a key word? Uh, a, a prevalent word in Romans. You will learn when using your Bible software, your, your logos, to generate uh, what uh, we call a master list. And that master list is going to have every word broken down by number of occurrences from the most all the way down to all those words that occur one time. And so, as you're analyzing this list, you're struck with the fact that outside of and and the, God is the most recurring word in the book of Romans. Now, at this point, that's just information. You're, you're not really moving beyond that. You're saying, well, obviously the book of Romans is a, is a book about God. Well, that's, that's too generic. Uh, you, you're going to want to narrow it down some uh, as uh, time goes on. But at least you've got something. You've got something to work with. And then my recommendation would be that you take your Bible and you determine what color you want God to be. And then you start, and this is going to take you some time, but you start coloring in every occurrence of the word God. Now with a a book, a 16 chapter book, and you a word that occurs 161 times, obviously you're going to have it a lot. But uh, when you do that, you're going to start seeing some patterns within the text, like a high concentration of the occurrence of the word God. And then you might, you might go five, six, seven verses where uh, the word God doesn't occur at all. Well, you would never have noticed that if you didn't mark up your Bible, if you didn't color code your Bible. You would never notice that. But now you say, well, there's a high concentration of the occur of the word name God here, but then we've got an entire paragraph in which the name God doesn't occur at all. Why is that? Ah, now we're starting to ask some exegetical questions. Questions that you would never ask, and now you're going to start seeing some things that you would never see before. So, find, finding these key words is something that the, the Bible software uh, can help you do, and if you don't have the Bible software, then you can use a concordance. All right, so what are we going to come up with? In Romans, we're going to come up with these words. Righteousness, 77 times. Does the word dikaiosune occur in, in some form in the book of Romans? Now, that's a bucket load of occurrences. For a 16-chapter book, to have 77 occurrences of one word, and it's not going to be translated the same. Now, those that were reading Greek, they're going to pick up on the fact that, boy, this word dikaiosune sure is occurring a lot. But in our English Bibles, we're going to say righteousness, 
justified, made right, or maybe the word right, and you may not see it. But when you color code your Bible, then you're saying, oh, that's the same word. It's translated righteous here, but it's translated justified there, but it's the same from the same root word in the Greek. So you you color the different words in English according to what the word was in the... Right. Okay. And so you're asking the software, I want... I'm, it's the word, the root word for righteous. And I want every occurrence of that root word. Uh, and so... And I want it in New American Standard. So it generates that list like I just showed you with God. Only now it's going to tell you, well, this is the word, but it's righteous here. And that's the word, but it's translated make right there. And that's the same word, but it's translated justify there. Are you following? All right. So now you could go and you can actually color code your Bible. And you're saying, wow, this is amazing. It's the same word are from the same root word, but I would never have seen that were it not for generating this master list and then uh, going through my English Bible and color coding uh, that. So, it's, it's a very helpful thing to do. Yeah. What about, uh, you talked about Greek, uh, just remembered, uh, good is kalos. Right. Good, beautiful, and then there's another term, in Greek term, for good, how do we know which which would it be? Well, would the software tell us? Yeah, it'll tell you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you said it's translated not the same. It is. Uh, it's translated the same, but it's a different Greek word. And First okay. Peter is a perfect illustration that you've got agathos and you've got kalos. Both of them are predominant words in First Peter, but you're not going to color them all the same color. Agathos, you're going to make blue, and Kalos, you're going to make red. And you say, well, why am I doing that? Because it's the same, it's, it's good. It's translated good. Because we're trying to get back to what the original book said. We're wanting to exegete what was there in the text. And he's using two different words that are translated in English words good, but they don't mean the same thing. Uh, one, agathos, means morally good. The other word, kalos, means generic good. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's important Very information to know. All right, law, 80 times. Uh, nomos occurs in some form. Sometimes it's uh, a verb. Sometimes it's a noun. Uh, but we're, we're grouping all of these together. And this is one of the really cool things about doing these kind of word studies is we're not delineating between nouns and verbs. Uh, maybe uh, it could be an adjective uh, that's all from the same root word. Uh, what the inspired writers are doing is they're drawing us to this word in all of its various forms. And so I want to know... <coughs> Every time that word occurs in any kind of form, whether it's a noun, whether it's a verb, uh, you know, or it's an adjective, I want to know every time. And I'm going to color it the same color every single time. So here I see faith. There I see believe. There I see trust. It's all pistuo, or pistos, but it's all from the same root word in Greek. And so I'm, my Bible is screaming out at me, this is the same word. Yeah, but it's faith and it's belief and it's trust. And No, that's, that's our, what our English is doing. But in the Greek, the inspired writer is hammering, hammering this word uh, and using it in all of its different forms. So it's pretty cool. And if you, if you don't, Take that information and color code your Bible, then the information is just, you've wasted your time. Because you're not, you're not ever putting it in a useful format. Follow? 
That's what makes it useful is color coding your Bible. That's when this information really becomes valuable. So you've got law, you've got sin, the word faith 62 times, God 161, which we already talked about, and then Christ 65 times. So now, in the book of Romans, I've got 220 t references to deity, and that's not even including the word Lord, which I don't know if I have it written down here. I think I do. No, I don't, but I think the word Lord is uh, 50 some odd times. So now, if you combine the three, God, Christ, and Lord, uh, you, you're, you're getting close to 300 references to deity in the book of Romans. That's, that's something that's, that's worthy of noting. Now, what I recommend that you do, and this is something that you probably could bypass, uh, but I would recommend that you, you not, uh, and that is you put this, these key words in a thesis statement. Now let's suppose that you've already read the book of Romans through, so you have a provisional sense of what the book is all about. But now that you've generated a master list of keywords, you want to put those keywords into a, a thesis statement. Um, who wants to take a, a college stab at putting this in some sort of a, a thesis statement? Using all six of those words, or all five of them at least. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm just making this up. I have no idea. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the law of righteousness keeps us from sin when we put our faith in Christ and God. Excellent. Very good. Okay, fair enough. Now, when we start studying the book, we're going to see whether that thesis statement is going to fly or flop. But that's okay. Because what you're going to find is very high percentage of the time, you're going to knock it out of the park. You're going to say, my thesis statement was, was right on. Now, there might be some, some nuances uh, that you'll say, well, that part of it was wrong, but the, the general thing was right. Um, go ahead, Jesse. You want to give it a try? Oh, I was going to say, uh, law brought about sin. Christ uh, brought about the righteousness of God through faith in him as Lord. Okay. You see what we're doing? Everybody follow what we're trying here? Um, now, uh, when Nathan and you were teaching... Isaiah, um, that's, what, that's what he did. Took the key words, put it into a thesis statement. And that was very helpful for the class because it gives you somewhat of a generic idea of what this book is all about, hammering the key words, uh, the, pre the, the prevalent words that are in that book. Now, this would be my attempt at this. Because of sin, man needs the righteousness of God. This righteousness is not going to come through law, but only through faith in Christ. Not add to me one sentence. Sorry, right. you can cheat and make it two. <laughs> And this righteousness? Oh, right now you might say, yeah, that's what you came up with after teaching Romans for 30 years. 
But this actually was that which was generated just by looking at keywords. It wasn't because of prior knowledge. Well, to some degree it had to have been, I guess. But if we just took a book that, for the most part, you know nothing about, DMI, and I just throw the keywords of DMI at you and say, all right, put this together in a thesis statement, chances are you're going to come up with an accurate thesis statement. And as you go through, there will be parts of it that will be tweaked. But for the most part, you're going to do well with this. Do these get easier with time, do more of them? Because I know Bob had us do them for the Pentateuch, and I don't think that was the only one that really struggled with. Come up with something that was accurate? No. I'm weird. Sorry. Yeah. Donnie, would you switch spots with him? He used to not be a third row. He's a fourth row guy. Is that why these three are the only ones on the first row? But you'll get better at it. And it's a process that chances are, until you came to the school, you never even tried to do something like this. Because, first of all, you weren't thinking about finding recurring words and then trying to do something with those recurring words. All right, so let's jump over to Matthew. These are what the logo generated list tells us are the predominant words found in the Gospel of Matthew. Do you usually put a lot of faith in what logos has come up with? I mean, because you've identified these. I mean, you just take it for what it is and start going through. Yeah. Yeah, and because it really is based on Greek. And so it's not able to mess up because, you know, it's based upon the actual Greek text. And it uses the UBS Greek text to generate these reports, which is the best Greek text. So, Denny, on the Perkamai and Proserkamai, would you color code those in the same color, or would you, because there's such a big difference? No, I would color them the same. Now, you may not have known, and you may not remember, that the word kingdom is basileic. That's okay, because the software is looking at the Greek word for you, whether you know that or not. And let me say this. The Young's and the Strong's concordance, they do the same thing. They're key to the original word, and then they're basing it off of the English. The one thing that you need to know, though, about a concordance is that if you're looking at the word kingdom, well, you'll get all of the occurrences of the word kingdom. But don't forget, look at the word king. Well, the word king comes from the same root word, and so you need to merge those two together. And then 
the word rule is from the same root word. So now you look up in your concordance the verb form to rule, and then you merge those with kingdom and king, and that generates a list of 78 times in the book. Now, there may be some free software that will do this for you. eSword might do this for you, but I'm not, anybody know? eSword, you can search by, within books, by the English translation. And so, for instance, when we were looking at Romans and righteousness, it came up that righteousness is in the King James Version 39 times, so it wasn't the same as the 77. You can also, there's a Greek New Testament with variants. You can search that for certain Greek words, but it didn't come up with the same number that what you had on the Romans. And here's why. And this is yet one more reason why logos is the way to go. And I know it's an investment, but it's going to be as thorough an exegetical tool as you can find. Because with Greek, you've got words that will have prefixes. With Greek, a preposition might be added to the beginning of a word, like we're talking about this pros erikomai. Well, pros is a preposition. And so you've got the word erikomai, which just means come, but pros, erikomai, pros is a prefix attached on to that word erikomai that means to come to. All right, well, that's something that you didn't have to even know that. Logos, you're asking it to find every occurrence of erikomai, even though you don't know you're asking it to find erikomai. You're asking it to find come in all of its different forms. And so, just like that, it comes up with 114 times. All right, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I need. And so, it's letting, remember, exegesis is to draw out. We're trying to get out of the text what's there. And I had no idea that Matthew, 114 times, is hammering this word erikomai. Well, at this point, I don't know what that means. So what? Because it could be nothing more than, well, Jesus went here, and then Jesus was coming there, coming, or people, you know, I don't know. You're talking about a book of people traveling a lot. How is that theologically significant? Maybe it's not a big deal. Fine, and that might be where you end up. But at least you're asking the question. And it just so happens that in the Gospel of Matthew, you'll discover that's not what's going on. That what Matthew is doing is he's talking about the various people that come to Jesus and the various reasons why. Satan came to tempt. The disciples came to learn. The sick came to be healed. There are people that come to Jesus for different reasons. And now I'm starting to see a theme, an idea that is coming from this gospel that is very cool. And what I did is I made a master list of all the people that came to Jesus and why. And then I preached a sermon on that. Because in a sense, coming to church is coming to Jesus. And you could make a parallel. Why did you come this morning? Did you come for the fellowship? Did you come for the free food? Did you come for uh, to worship? Did you come because you've got problems? Why did you come? Why are we here today? And then, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you... You've got an automatic, unbelievably cool conclusion to the sermon. Well, Jesus...
Jesus is saying, come. That'll preach. <laughs> that is very deep. But see, it, it, it's all this, this process of saying, all right, so Eric my is the key word in Matthew. What does that mean? Well, then you start working it, you start color coding, you start analyzing, and then you, you're, you're, you're digging through, and all of a sudden you're going, look at this diamond that's in there. I would never have seen that diamond had I not worked my way through this process. And you want to know how many commentaries are going to tell you about that? Probably none. Just yours. I was going to say, just his on Ezekiel. I don't have one on Matthew, so you wouldn't have got it from me. Okay, so if I was going to take this and I was going to put it into a thesis statement, I might come up with something like this. In order to establish Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew emphasizes Jesus' teaching that focused on God as Father and the coming kingdom of heaven. In addition, Matthew demonstrated that there were many who came to Jesus and became his disciples. Now, that's maybe a little clumsy. Uh, it could be re reworked. Um, but I kept it that way because this was my first attempt. And I thought, no, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it. idea of the key words that will help you keep focused on the book, but, I mean, if you don't know anything about the book, are you really going to be able to come up with an accurate statement? Uh, it'll be ballpark, uh, and there, like I said, there, there may be some little aspects to that that you'll miss, but chances are you're, you're going to be pretty, pretty close. Now, what happens when when you, you miss it is when you miss some key words. Uh, I, I didn't realize that was one of the key words in the book. Um, well, that's going to change uh, your thesis statement. All right, so let's say we were just going to have an exercise in which we were going to study 1 Peter. And our job was to find frequently occurring words in 1 Peter. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, call up the, the, um, the Bible software and I'm just going to ask it to generate a list of all words. And you, all you do is you say, I want every noun, verb, and adjective in First Peter. And so, just like that, it's going to generate uh, this master list. Now, it's going to separate the nouns and the verbs. So, it's going to have faith as... A noun, pistos, in one list, and then it's going to have to believe, uh, pistuo, as another list. But what you're going to do is you're going to say, merge those together. I want all of the pista words in one master list. And in one half of a second, it's going to uh, generate that list for you. Now I'm ready to go color code my Bible and mark uh, those key words. So then I'm going to make a list. I've come up with uh, X number of words. So I'm going to I'm going to generate a, a master list. I'm going to try to 
at least come up with 10 words. That's very subjective. You know, the bigger the book, the more words you're going to have. The shorter the book, the less words you're going to have. So just kind of play with that as time goes on. And I've gotten to where, you know, I pretty much can determine a logical break-off point of where, okay, I'm not going to be color-coding anymore. I think, for example, with Isaiah, I marked 20-some-odd words. It's a big book, 66 chapters. So the 25 words that occurred, I forget now, 40 times or more. Okay, so I went through, color-coded that. So you make a list. Then you develop your preliminary thesis statement, just like we did with Romans, just like we did with Matthew. How is that different than the purpose statement? The purpose statement is actually in the text. Okay, it's something that the author is saying? Yeah. In effect, though, that's kind of what we're doing. We're still saying this is kind of his purpose statement, but we're generating it from the key words. All right, so this is what I would come up with. And in red are the key words for 1 Peter. Suffering, God, Christ, Jesus, holy, conduct, Lord, grace, sin. In the midst of suffering, God is calling his children to imitate the faith of Christ Jesus. In being holy, by living their lives with proper conduct, if Jesus is truly our Lord, we will find grace, having our sins forgiven. And I can already see that. We forgot to color one of the key words in. Now, if you've studied 1 Peter, you know that that pretty much hammers it right there. That is the essence of the book. Well, but that was just by merging together the key words. Now, I've already read through the book, so I already had a provisional sense. But now I'm seeing the recurrence of words, and I'm coming up with this thesis statement. All right, so do you have an idea of how to find key words? Again, Mike's going to walk you through that next quarter. You'll be doing that. What I've done is all 66 books, I've got a master list already generated. And you can save those in a little section that's just called favorites. And so you've already always got those. The report's already been generated. You don't have to ask it to generate it every single time. But once you generate it, you just kind of, it's like a drag and drop sort of thing. You just grab it and you drop it in your Genesis folder, which you've already created. And then it's always there for you. And it's very, very handy. So, doing this with whatever book it is that you're studying. And 
obviously, in order to, to really become uh, well-versed at exegesis, you need to keep doing this with every new book that, that you're studying. And so, if on Wednesday night, wherever you're at, you're either uh, teaching 1 Samuel or you're sitting in the class where the guy's teaching 1 Samuel, go through this and generate uh, these reports on the particular books. And then, with the individual words, like that word God that I showed in Romans, uh, I, I dragged and dropped that into my Romans folder. So not only do I have the master list, but I also have uh, the sub-lists of the individual words and how, much, how often they occur uh, within the book. Now, what I showed you just a minute ago was something that I actually have uh, uh, printed off and I distributed the master list to all the guys in Romans. And so they had literally every word uh, of the, every occurrence of every key word that was found in Romans. Now, they should be able to do that on their own as time goes on. But anyway, that's the kind of stuff uh, that uh, that you have available. Now, if uh, are you familiar with Evernote? Uh, now, see, with Evernote, I've got on my phone. And so if I'm in the middle of nowhere, and as long as I have uh, uh, access, uh, then... I can call up keyword lists, and I told you the story the other day about, uh, you know, somebody asking uh, for a, a keyword list, and I didn't have one on my Evernote, but I thought Mike probably did, and so, you know, he's at Disneyland, and in two minutes he sent me uh, all of the keywords for whatever book it was, I forget now which even what I was asking, but so anyway, I'm in the process of of getting all of those reports for. Uh, all of the, the books and then storing it in the uh, Evernote account. Okay, so that's the first of the four P's. Prevalence. Now let's move to the second P, and that is purpose statement. Now, all we're doing here is we're saying, how do we find keywords for a book? And the one is just by the fact that these words occur frequently. That's going to give us a clue that it's a key word. But let's say that I do not have access to anything at all that's going to give me all the occurrences of a particular word. Is there any other way I can find keywords? Well, yeah, there is. And that's if there is a purpose statement. Now, what is a purpose statement? A purpose statement is where the inspired writer is telling us why he wrote this book. The purpose of this book is... Now, we have a number of these in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Examples, 1 Timothy 3.15. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Right? That's why I'm writing. Why are you writing? That you might know how to conduct yourself in God's house. That's what I'm writing. All right, so if you were looking at this, what words might you guess are going to be recurring words in the book? Conduct. Truth. Truth. Church. Church. No. What? No. No. And <laughs> 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 
throw you in there. Well, well played. Well played. Is that it? True. Is there something about the household or the... Don't know, but we're at least asking. Uh, does the word household occur anywhere else? Um, all right, so <clears throat> when I... I analyze... This is what I find. The word no occurs four times. The word ought occurs four times. Conduct, this is the only time in the book. Well, so probably not key word, but um, church three times. Pillar once, support once. Um, household, God, truth are also words that uh, then say, well, at some level, they're important, at least in this thematic verse. Uh, Going to be important words. So, are those words? I mean, are those? Are any of those even keywords in the book? It's like four times. That just doesn't seem like very much. Well, for a, a six-chapter book, uh, you're. I don't know. Uh, usually, you're not going to find a word occur more than um, probably eight or nine times in a, in a book that size. So, you know, don't be looking for something that's going to occur 50 times in, you know, a six-chapter book like First Timothy. But, but you are going to find some others. I'm not saying this is all of them, but I am saying that this has given you a head start, at least on where to look. Where do, you, where do I look for keywords if I don't have access to uh, Logos Bible software, I don't have access to a Strong's or something like that? You look for a, uh, a purpose statement like this. Now, it just so happens that the word God occurs. Wait a minute. God occurs 22 times. Faith occurs 19 times. <coughs> the word good or beautiful occurs 16 times. Tell me which book are you talking of? First Timothy? Talking about, yeah, First Timothy. What I don't have on there that I, I needed to have on there is that Christ occurs 15 times. No, I have that. Jesus, sorry, occurs 14 times. Actually, I can already see that I need to update that because I've got Pistos 19, Pistos 11, and Pistos 203. Um, and added together, that makes 33, but there are actually 35 total occurrences of Pistos in the book. So uh, last time I did that, I found two more. 
Will these word lists evolve over time with our maturity and yeah, the work? <coughs> they uh, they will. Now, missing one or two is not going to be you know, the end of the world, um, but it is. You know, I'm I'm at the point now where it just drives me nuts to have, have missed one. <laughs> All right, so now when I look at our thematic verse, household, well, that occurred, what was it, five times? God occurred 22 times. Fruit uh, occurred six times. So those words that are in red uh, were words that uh, occurred with some frequency. Some of the other words that we were Surmising might be keywords uh, four times, three times, one time uh, isn't necessarily going to uh, make it become a, a, a keyword except for the fact that it's in a purpose statement verse. And whenever you've got a purpose statement verse, then you've got to at least be thinking about uh, how that idea predominates the book. Now, let me illustrate, since we're talking about 1 Timothy. He says that he's writing so that you might know how one ought to conduct himself. All right, so it's a book about church conduct. Chapter 1, church conduct with false teachers. Chapter 2, church conduct as far as prayer. Uh, chapter 2, last part, church conduct as far as roles for men and then roles for women. Uh, chapter 3, church conduct regarding elders and then regarding deacons and then regarding women. Uh, and then chapter 4, talk about church conduct regarding, uh, you know, uh, ministry in general. The last part of chapter 4 in the way the preacher needs to conduct himself. Chapter 5, conduct regarding uh, widows, regarding good elders, regarding sinning elders. Uh, so you can see how you're taking this verse and then you're applying it to the book, even though that word is not that that's occurring all that frequently. Okay, let's take a look. Do you want to Oh, I'm not. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to mess around with you. I forgot. <laughs> He's talking figuratively. That's funny. You can send that to me? Oh. The right. I'm watching you. <laughs> All right. I bought this a few months ago. You just don't want to cross that.
Yeah, let me, let me, uh, dig in another illustration of the cut. How long did your microphone last for you? Did you have about another couple options? Uh, whoa. Or what, into the second uh, quarter? You did about two hours. I got like a couple of minutes or two hours before they started, before the first one went. How much did you write when you had a couple of buttons? Right, because I'm just, gonna, I'm going to look at it. Thanks, buddy. Really Appreciate it. Yeah. Bye, y'all. I don't care about that. They, they do, but they look just like the mic. Uh, so I don't know if maybe they're, 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 they're made the same. That, like the idea of that whole thing of being a shit on me and you're black. Um, well, then, okay, so for a fact, the first thing, you just have to write care. Because Bob said he is it Christ in the Christ image. Yeah, that's all I did with my yeah, that's, all I did. Yeah. that's all I did. It's just, it was just random. They were just I pull, I pull randomly in the bag. It's not, yeah. And but weren't you writing on something else when it broke? No, like I literally I pull the cap off and it just starts gushing out. So it's like I was like, well, what's going on? Like it wasn't like I can understand if I'm riding and okay, I'm pressing too hard or no, this was like the preacher's nightmare. I pull it out and it just starts dumping ink. It was crazy. So you have to be very careful. Wow. Um, this is before grief started. Um. Okay, so why is my, after my first summer? Yeah, why would Christ? So um, a year, almost a year and a half now. I got and mine during the summer. Year. You got yours right after summer. You had them for a year and a half because. Yeah. Right I mean, this one I used yeah, for. My, my, this one's almost completely out. It, well, it is basically out, and that's because I used it for yeah, more than just mine. Okay. Okay. I, I used them for yeah. like taking notes in Greek and stuff. Okay. I wrote a ton of margin notes. But yeah, and they, they were great. But these, I got these. Caleb had. When I did the summer intern with him, he had a small set. Mm -hmm. Then he went online and found this one on Amazon. So I went ahead and ordered it too because it was so cheap. And the, and the instruments are cool. Exactly. They do look cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it start, I came with it. It started out with one. And then we were like the church. We just read. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so if you want to be a part. Like, it's like a okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's all happening again. Yeah. It is. Um, no, it's master this. It started I, I with just, one, I feel like and then the we got, yeah. and then it went to, to another class. Yeah. 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 Wait. Oh wow. That just came to me. And that's because it wasn't any time. That's ridiculous. Then you're ridiculous. Look at Lynn. It's your life. I'm thinking that when you call my phone, what does that mean? Have you ever been in the old thing and you're like, it's just. I'll be like one person at a time. Thank you. That's so funny. Yeah. That's so funny. What did you say, First uh, Timothy four, for conduct regarding? I I didn't get it written down. Um, general living is the first part, and then preacher's conduct 
in the last part. Okay. <clears throat> Mark, are you going to teach class in the morning tomorrow as well? You mean at 8 o'clock? Yeah. Uh, no, sure. I wasn't planning it. I just wasn't sure if that's when you were going to switch with Dave. Uh, no, Dave and I talked about that, and I'll pick up my missing class after the break. Okay. I got lost for a second on the first team. Well, it's I, it, the word right isn't in verse 15. You know, the New American Standard supplied it, and that's why it's italics. Okay. But uh, it belongs, I mean, first. So right, that's, yeah. that's where it comes from. The word right comes from. So I'm going to switch back and forth and just go through. Four minutes show we have a look at um, another example. Yeah, look at First uh, Timothy two nine. Logos. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember if it's like, well, in the King. You got yeah, I, 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 I forgot how to say it. What I I do individually individually. In like manner yeah. also that when I know what the key word is, so I just run a list. Oh, yeah, but, I, uh, I, I forgot how to bring say, it to say all of them. I have to look at my notes. Uh, in like manner also that women adorn no, themselves in the modest apparel. I was trying to do it the other day. Face of this sobriety, and not with embroidered hair or gold or pearls or costly or anything. What did you buy that was so the likewise is um, likewise I want. In I, verse 8, I want I again. I my verse 9, book. likewise I want the women. But the king Jim didn't carry the it. I want down. My there he is. Yeah. Yeah. Is camp. it a 351 in it? Third. It's implied. <laughs> it is. Yeah, so I got and involved. really, it should it should have been. He's been over a certain amount. Uh, it should have been right. put in the text. Bright yellow hat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I won't yeah. wear. Because it's very bright. I knew a kid that he was down in the military while he was in the active life. Took a 68 Mustang and put a 351 in it. I mean, that thing scary. Yeah, I was thinking about doing it. I had a 351, but I had the big block 351. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I almost did, but I thought that's, I, I'm, I don't really, I won't even Wait, drive it because it'll be so much gas, and, and it's just, it's already light enough in the back. I mean, not need it. So, and I'm not going for really super fast. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to run nice, mm-hmm. down good, and if I do want to go a little fast, I can. This one, I don't remember which one it was, but I think it was the big block because we had to beat the strip towers. The the common one is uh, Cleveland. And that's the that's, that's technically the middle. Yeah, this one is that's one. that's the common one, and that's the one that's made four more seats. The I think it's the Windsor yeah, is the one that was in the truck, which is the big one. That's what I had. Um, I got it. It was out of a car. It was, I don't want to lose those big clothes. Oh, mm-hmm. um, I, I ended up giving it. My cousin gave it to me, and then I ended up giving it back to him when I moved because I was like, I don't have any place to put it. I wanted to keep it, but I didn't have any place to put it in the trunk. For sure. Oh, oh yeah, 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 come on. Because yeah. yeah. I wanted to slowly rebuild it. How will you get it? But oh no, I I get from a jagger. Was that cool? Okay, I was thinking of that one. But oh, you would have been a more Friday, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Friday is usually after school. Everyone's in there. No, yeah. Homework. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how it pulls up this menu. I got it. So you choose the different types of words. You want uh, adverbs, noun, adjectives. I heard that. Did you actually have to make them? How these are just here uh, for free? Yeah, yeah. No, Mark had a question. Mm-hmm. Remember when I was not getting well, I left 
you downloaded it for me? Is that homiletics lecture? Yes. Half an hour after class starts? Yeah. Okay. You wrote it for me. You just put it in the. That's the truth. Thank you. Put it on you. Oh, on the day. Okay. Because I'll add that in. Then are you scared of Every morning in the uh, senior year of high school, that was the, that was the smell of the classroom. Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe impatience. Am I distracting you, Donnie? Yes, you feel like yeah. we're inferior back here? I, I have Tim's number. I need to just call him. You shouldn't feel bad about that, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just be yourself. Actually, I can't see. I think they're trying to go. And that post is that way. Yes, that post is in the way. Lynn thought I was likely. How did you do that to get multiple ones? Because, like, I can pull it up. Oh, or that. Click oh. one. And then space. Capital one. Okay. I you typically that. just want to look up. Is there a space after the war? Yep. So you need to do a space after. It's going to do that there. Okay. Right. No, you need or. Or. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you need And you typically want to just look up those four things. Adjectives, adverbs, nouns, yeah. 